and good morning. And here we are at, on the last day of Anarchapulco 2019. And I'm here with the esteemed, amazing, yes, almost godlike, Max <laughs> Egan. <laughs> and he is an He's an author, he's a researcher, he's a filmmaker, he's a public speaker, and most of all, he is a bastion of truth and understanding. Uh, Not godlike, though. <laughs> to each his own. But <laughs> the, the thing that I love about Max is that he, in a very calm and balanced, intel intelligent, non-threatening manner, he manages to encapsulate all the myriad of idea, the myriad ideas that we are dealing with in this awakening truth uh, sovereignty movement, whatever we might call it, I'm not even sure what we're calling it anymore. <laughs> um, and in he packages it in such a lovely, non-threatening manner that enables understanding, because he speaks to the whole human experience, which is basically how we've fall, fallen into this programming, how we have become entangled in the matrix, and even those who consider themselves awake are not even awake because we're still being programmed. So I'm just going to uh, start off with that. And one of the most fascinating con concepts, and I think this is particularly um, a hard thing for Westerners to grasp, is the concept of everything I have, I give, that you live by. Yeah, well, you know, I've, I've, I've just found that life is an emotional mirror. And if you give to people, the universe provides for you. I mean, it's, it's a weird thing. You know, you surrender to, to the, the flow and just give when you need to, but give unconditionally. You yes. know? And I found that if I give unconditionally, because I don't really want for much, I don't need much. You know, what do I need really to live? I don't need much at all. Right. Um, and I, I tend to just give and help people with all that I can. And I found that by doing that, the universe reflects it back to me. I'm always where I need to be, things always work out for me, it just, it just always manages to flow. You know, and I don't plan it, it just kind of happens. I'm going to move this you... closer because I'm afraid of the, the noises picking up around us. Keep That's going. right, but you've got, you've, got to, you've got to lose connect, lose attachment to the outcome and all this stuff. I mean, that's what I do. I just give what my heart tells me to, listen to my intuition and lose attachment, and the universe just flows. Well, yeah? So, but we're, you know, we're still caught up in the West. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> but most people are caught up in the idea of titles, education, how much money do I have, how big is my car. Oh, hey, can we just pause this one sec? Because uh, there's Jessica. Yeah. I, Sorry. I don't have we, the ability to pause this. We can start again because we're okay. only two minutes in. going to be able to see you too, darling. No, you, I'll just stick my head in. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> we don't care about me. And no, we do. Come on. Back to Max. We're talking about entrapments and the titles and the that we think are important? Well, the entrapments and the titles. I mean, the, the problem is with our society is that, like, um, it's often like what I refer to as, as three pathogens that, that manage our thinking. You know, one of them is the uh, economic pathogen, mm -hmm. whereby we believe that it's, we, we, we measure people by how much money they have in the bank and how much their, their uh, economic worth is. The other is the social pathogen, whereby we we measure people by their social status and, and we judge people by the size of their front doors and we think that we are our stuff, mm -hmm. you know, but we're not, you know, no, we're, not. We're, we're this unique experience and, and we think that if we collect all this stuff and climb to the top of the pile, mm -hmm. there's actually going to be something there, but there isn't. There's nothing there. There's nothing there, you know, I, I saw a man on the beach in Venice Beach who was crying his eyes out mm. and, you know, wow, why are you crying? And he just said, because I just realised I could have done this 60 years ago. Just sat on the oh, beach. That's you know? and, and that's what we miss out on. You know, As John Lennon said, life is what happens while you're planning other things. Mm -hmm. you know? And it, it's about the journey. The journey is the life. The journey. See, people are looking for enlightenment and looking for all this stuff. You know, caught up in the matrix and looking for enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And they think it's this place that they're going to get to where they're suddenly going to be sitting on top of a mountain and they're glowing or something, you know. They've suddenly got all the knowledge, ah, nirvana, you know. It's not like that. It, it's, right. a, it's a place that you never get to. It's the journey itself. Yes. You know, it's like, as Castaneda said, uh, the journey to Ixland. Yes. But Ixland is the place that you, you think you're going to, but it doesn't exist. Right. The journey itself is Ixland. Yes. You know, okay. so 
Interesting, and and it's a hard concept to grasp. It's a hard concept to grasp, but when you when you feel that and you, you see, you start to see the value of yourself. See, people people in our society have been had their value taken from them as humans, Indeed. and they've been given these false things to to look as as value. Mm-hmm. You know, our front door, our car, our this, our that. But what is what is valuable in you? Is the, is the thing they're looking for that value, but they don't know what they're looking for. Because they had this thing taken from them, but they don't know what it is. So exactly. how, how can you know what you're searching for if you don't know what's been stolen from you? That's such and a it's, paradox. It's this, it's this personal value. So, you know, and, and they, they look for it externally with all this stuff. And really what it is, is it's the experience. Exactly. And it's, it's how you do it moment by moment. That is the value. And that is what it's about. And that is life. This is all a demigod. Famous <laughs> people wandering around everywhere, folks. This is, it's like, it's like a mecca for wonderful people here. Um, I want to bring up the concept of Tartaria because it's such a mind, uh, you know, it's not, e- it's not easy to blow my mind these days. Mm. We know too much, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, we just kind of shrug it off and say, yeah, I figured or I know. But this is a new concept to me because the idea that something existed as near uh, as recently as 200 years ago, possibly this mm. landmass that encompassed. Well, it's still the, there. I mean, the landmass is still the, there, the, but, but the, the, the the empire. The empire. Yeah. And that you explained how uh, history can be changed in one generation. Yeah. So, could you explain how that could occur? Well, you know, if there was if there was some sort of a cataclysm, if there was some sort of an event that wiped out most of the adult population. And the world was repopulated by children. You can teach the children any history you want. And when you look at the the, uh, if you go back and look at the foundling trains and the orphan trains and the foundling hospitals in the late 1800s, then you begin to see uh, an enormous amount of child trafficking that was happening. Like 435,000 children shipped around Europe in one year. 200,000 children uh, trafficked across the United States in foundling trains. You just Take your children, yes, pick your children, and you can look at it. It's all there in, in uh, mainstream history. Um, the, the, the foundlings that were shipped out to Australia, to Africa, to mm-hmm. New Zealand, you know. And there's evidence. I mean, there's old maps that exist that show this nation of Tartaria, the Empire of Tartaria, which encompassed mm-hmm. most of Europe, India, North America, uh, Philippines, parts of Australia. It was all this one nation, and it appears to have taken most of the world under its wing. And everybody kind of seemed to be cooperating and getting along fine. Mm-hmm. And um, there appears to have been free energy and all sorts of stuff. And we're finding remnants of this, this uh, civilization exists in all countries. It's right under our noses, but we haven't really noticed it. Yes. So um, it's, the, the fact that it's been expunged from history so effectively is, is what is amazing about it. It is amazing. You know? But when you, when you begin to grasp the concept of it, and with Tartaria, I mean, they're saying it's just this big tract of land in... in uh, in Northern Europe, in, in North Eastern Europe, yes. uh, encompassing Russia and rah, rah, rah. And they say, oh, it's just attractive land. It was never really a country. But you can look in US flag books from the 1850s and find a Tartarian flag in there. Oh, so if it, wasn't, if it wasn't a country, why did it, why did it have a flag? And this is why you, you know? have to buy old history books that have been out of print for a few decades. Yeah, and you can find things as well, like um, the Napoleonic War. Um, was that really a war between Napoleon and Russia? Or was it a war of Napoleon and Russia, France and Russia, combined against Tartaria? Because was Moscow a Tartarian city? You know, was, what is history the way we're told? And it's interesting because we're told that Napoleon went to war with Alexander, and yet you can find a plaque which has the face of Alexander and the face of Napoleon on it with a, with a Russian inscription which basically says, in unity there is strength. Now, what's that doing there? Indeed. And why did Napoleon march past St. Petersburg and attack Moscow when St. Petersburg was the capital of Russia, apparently? You know, he would have marched past there and hooked up with Alexander his army, mm-hmm. and then they both marched on Moscow, which was a Tartarian city. And the, the flag of Tartaria actually was a griffin, which mm-hmm. is interesting. Mm-hmm. And the coat of arms of Russia, which was... And that, that, that battle happened around, like, 1812. You know, the 1812 overture we hear yes. about, you know? Um, that was that, that war of, of Napoleon and Russia, the, the, the Napoleonic Wars. So that would have been the, the time that the final blow was given and, and Moscow was taken from Tartaria. And as I said, the flag of um, uh, Tartaria was a griffin. And if you look at the Mus- Moscow coat of arms, you'll find that it, is, it was, was founded in 1880. 
So after that period, and it is a orthodox knight with a with a on a horse with a spear slaying a griffin. Nice. Very interesting. Indeed that that would be is. the Moscow coat of arms, <laughs> isn't it? You know? Oh boy. So there's all this evidence that this nation was here and that we we're all connected to this nation. Um, there's evidence that uh, there were um, white tribes and black tribes living in much of the, the mm -hmm. in Australia, in many of the places. They're all living in peace. Um, evidence that the whole slavery thing we've been told is wrong. So um, many of the black people in America are very likely Native Americans, didn't uh -huh. come from Africa. I mean, everything, it, nothing is what we've, so we've been the, told. So even the true history we thought we've discovered is not even true. It's, no. It eradicates everything we thought the, we knew. All they've got to do is shift, shift timelines and shift people's histories around. Like for example, um, you look at the history of, of England and the story of King Arthur. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at Ulysses, the tales of Ulysses, yes. Ulysses documented sailing to a green island west of Greece. Mm -hmm. The only green island we can find west of Greece is England. Uh -huh. And he named that as Syria. Right? <laughs> and they, they, there's speculation that that's where Surrey gets its name. And also, if uh. you look through Syrian history, yes. you'll find the story of King Arthur, which exists in Syrian history. And, and it's not the, pulling the sword from the stone, but it's the same families, married the same people, did the same, it's the same story. Yes. You know? And it exists as a, as a legitimate part of Syrian history, and now we see it as British myth. Correct. You know? I mean, so I understand. all they've got to do is, is shift things around and, and teach the people, write it down in books that look great, and teach people whatever history you want. So, you know, and you can you can change history completely in three generations without anyone knowing. Mm -hmm. And but if you there was a cataclysm, and most of the what the adult population was wiped out, and children were sent out there to, to run a clean up operation, and and you, they wouldn't be even asking about history. No, so you can surviving. teach them anything you want. Exactly. And that appears to be what happened. There appears to have been some sort of event that happened uh, mid uh, or early 1800s that, that decimated a lot of the earth and okay. uh, some sort of a cataclysm. And then the, the parasites that run the world now seize the opportunity and repopulated the world with children. I mean, I know it's a bit of pill to swallow and it's a, a really out there thing to think about. But, but there's a lot of evidence to support the hypothesis. But the you know? point is this, regardless if you buy into the Tartaria theory or not, or proceed to do your own research, which I am going to do um, also, because this is fascinating, uh, it points to the fact that we cannot believe any kind of authority whatsoever, authority, fake authority, we cannot believe anything except our own empirical evidence that we have discovered yeah. and filtered through our intuition. So. Yeah. But uh, e even with all this Tartaria stuff, it's important to understand we're trying to find the way through this. We exactly. don't know. Exactly. You know. So people are putting out there saying, this is, this is, we don't know. Right. We know that, that this empire was there. We're trying to piece it all together, you know, so. So question everything. We've got to, we've got to get out of the system of control before it ru destroys humanity, essentially, yeah. is where yeah. we're at. Yeah. So Mr. Egan, Max Egan, you are awesome. Thank you so much. Is there anything? No, that's good. Okay, God bless good, you. Don. Thank you for Thank talking you, with us. My pleasure. <laughs> You're awesome.